So today's lesson is going to be about all things must be fulfilled. All things must be fulfilled. Everything in this Bible has to come to pass, doesn't it? So um, I guess what we're going to do, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off last week. And last week we were studying about how we were wonderfully and fearfully made. And that's found in the book of Psalms. And we learned that God Almighty cares about us so much that he wonderfully and fearfully made us and that we love him so much for all that he's done for us. And then we jumped into Jeremiah and we found out that God Almighty knew us before we was even in our mommy's belly. He knew us because he specially designed us. He specially created us for his glorification, for his, for his happiness, I guess you could say, because it made him happy to, to make us. And then we got into the book of Ephesians and we found out that God knew us before the foundations of the world or this earth was even thought of. So it's really exciting to know that God Almighty, sitting on his throne with all the angels, knows us in a personal way, doesn't he? He knows our name, and he knows everything about us. So that leads us up to, to, to today's lesson, and we're going to talk a little bit about how all things must happen in our life. There's not a day of our life goes by that God Almighty doesn't know what's going on. And each day is very, very special. And each day of Jesus' life was so special because each day he did something else for the kingdom of God. And he explained to us why he came to this earth. Jesus came to this earth to teach us and to talk about the kingdom of God, didn't he? He said, in heaven, we love one another. In heaven, we have joy. In heaven, we're happy. We're good. We're gentle. We're meek. And Jesus brought the message of heaven to earth, didn't he? That we need to be kind to one another. We need to be loving. And who knows what's going on over in Israel right now with all them missiles and all them rockets and all them guns and all the mass killing that's going on. And we know that that is not the will of our Father, is it? Because Jesus came with love. He came with kindness. He says, if you have two coats, give one to somebody that needs it. If you got an abundance of food, give it to the poor. If you have abundance of money, if you have whatever God tells you to do, be, be kind and loving to one another. Don't be selfish and jealous. And, of course, we, in past lessons we talked about the works of the flesh, didn't we, where people are jealous and animosity and hatred and evil and it goes on and on. But Jesus didn't come to teach us a message because Jesus came to teach us a message about what? About our heart. It's all about the condition of our heart, isn't it? And the condition of our heart should be the fruits of the Spirit, shouldn't it? And this morning we learned about faith. And, of course, faith, uh, when I say this morning, I mean this morning at, at 10 o'clock service here at Jesus as Lord Ministries, we learned about faith and how important it is that we live by faith. And that God gave each one of us a measure of faith, didn't he? And that's one of the fruits of the Spirit that Jesus expects us to live by faith. So as we go on here, we're going to learn, uh, you know, uh, about how God has the steps of a good man ordered by the Lord. So I, last week I started my testimony from the time that I was born, a little Lutheran boy. Uh, and I was brought up into church and we went to Sunday school and did all kind of things like that. And I kind of um, left off when I was the age of about maybe 11 years old or so. And uh, so we're going to pick up when I was, was about 11 years old. And that was the, the year of 1969. And as, as my children tell me, Dad, that was a long time ago. And uh, so in 1969, at the age of 11, I was still a little Lutheran farm boy and um we uh at 11 years old we was helping a lot of the farmers around the small town that i grew up in i grew up in fairfield pennsylvania and uh, most of the farmers went to the church that we went to and and at 10 and 11 years old we would go and we would make hay for the farmers because back then they didn't have the big round bales they had the little short long bales so they made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these bales of hay, and we had to pick them up in the field and take them into the barns for the farmers. And that's what we did 
in the uh, in the summertime whenever we wasn't going to school and uh, and we helped other farmers pick the cherries and pick the apples and the peaches and things like that anything we could do to help out on the farms we did as children alongside of our, our, our parents who had very large gardens back then and so we worked in the garden so we was always doing something but it always reminded you of the kingdom of heaven because Jesus told the parables, didn't he, about stewardship and about farming and about planting seeds. So we, <coughs> we um, worked with all these farmers, probably about four or five different farms that we worked on as little guys. But as time would have it, I, um, I started working on a, on a very large farm. But I did want to say that all these farmers that we worked with bailing hay and worked in the, in, the, in the orchards and things like that there, they all went to church, but you never heard them talk about Jesus. You never heard them bring up the, anything about the Bible. It may be that they didn't mix religion and, and, and uh, working on the farms together, but it's just my young mind remembers that uh, they never talked about Jesus. They never witnessed. And the thing about it is, you was never told that you had to be born again like Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 and 3. We never heard growing up that you had to be born again. We never heard that Jesus had to be the Lord of your life. We never heard that you had to ask Jesus into your heart to cleanse you and, and, to, and to ask for forgiveness of your sins. We never heard that you had to have fellowship with God Almighty every day. We never heard that you had to have a relationship. We never heard that you had to have habitation of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, that you had to create a clean heart inside you. What we was taught was Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that for by grace are you saved, not of yourself, it's a gift of God. And, and that gift, they believe in these religious churches that it's a gift of God. And like I always say, it is a free gift. The the salvation is a free gift, but believe me, it puts you on the path because Jesus talked about the straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life. And Jesus talked about the broad and wide path that leads to destruction, that leads to everlasting damnation. And we never heard that growing up. We always heard that God loves you. And you're okay in the condition you are. So all these different farmers that we work for all went to church, but nobody talked about what Jesus talked about, that we have to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Christ rose from the dead. So all these different farms. So then at the age of 14, I had enough experience working on farms that I, get to go, I got to be hired by a, a bigger farm, and it actually consisted of three large farms. And each one of these farms had, I don't know, probably 50, 60 cattle on, on each one of these uh, farms. And they had many, many orchards. They had apple orchards and cherry orchards and pear orchards and all different kind of orchards that we took care of. So we worked continuously, you know, like Saturday mornings, we had to grind feed. You had to take corn and barley and wheat and bales of hay. And it was those great big grinders that you would feed us in. And we had to make 100 bags of feed every Saturday morning and then take it to these three different farms and distribute it to the cattle so that they, that they had feed for the cattle. And then when we weren't working on that, we were probably baling hay at, at, these, at this farm. But it was so fun because the, it was like five full-time employees that worked there they, they were older guys, and I say older, they were probably 50, 60 years old, and they were fun to work around because they left us, we was only 14 years old, but they left us drive the pickup trucks and the tractors and, and all the different machinery on the farm. So at 14 years old, I mean, I thought I was, you know, really, really doing good. But once again, these five guys, these adults, they never talked about Jesus. Now, these farmers, I don't, think that they even went to church they just um they were farmers so they um <clears throat> they didn't talk about jesus so once again you got to remember that the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord so whatever god was doing in my life he was molding me shaping me to move on 
uh, in his divine will because God has a will for each one of us. And, uh, and that's, um, that's what we have to focus on is the fact that we have to uh, be in God's will. So I want to read a scripture to you here. It's found in the Gospel of Luke. It's in the 24th chapter. It's in the 40, it starts at verse 44. And this is Jesus talking. And Jesus said, <coughs> excuse me, these are the words which I speak, which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45 says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And Jesus said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it is behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and, the, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of all these things. Now, the Holy Spirit is teaching us by the Bible that all things have to be fulfilled. Every single step of Jesus' life was ordained of God. And the Bible tells us that every single step of our life is ordained by God. God knew us before we was in mommy's belly. God knew us before the foundation. God knew every step that we were going to take. So back to my testimony, I'm, like I say, I was kind of like uh, 14 years old and, and I'm working on these farms and working with all these old guys, but no one's telling me about Jesus. No one's witnessing to me. I don't know, I'm just like, but the whole time that I was working on these farms, I was still going to the Lutheran church. I was still going to the youth group at the Lutheran church. I was still learning the word of God and I still had a God-given mother and father who feared God, who had Bible studies with us, who taught us the Bible, who taught us the Ten Commandments, who taught us the Lord's Prayer, who taught us to say our prayers. And, and so the whole time as I was growing up working on these farms and just doing whatever had to be done, I was still acknowledging that God Almighty was on the throne. I knew God was on the throne, but I didn't know him in a personal way. I wasn't seeking first the kingdom of heaven and all of its righteousness. So as time went on, um, I, I worked at this uh, farming things here, and you have to understand that the, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, because as time went on, as I got a little bit older, um, I worked on that farm for about two years until I was 16 years old. And when I turned 16 years old, I bought a 1965 Chevrolet Chevelle Malibu. Well, I thought I had, you know, the perfect car, everything. And it turns out that I didn't have the, the car very long, about a month or two. And I decided I was going to buy a motorcycle. So I bought a 250 Suzuki. Now, I don't know if you can see what's slowly spiraling, what's slow the, the devil's trying to put this web around me, isn't he? Now I got the pleasures of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. I got a Chevelle. I got a motorcycle. I got a pretty good job, so I thought. But I was still going to high school. And, uh, and the, the devil was slowly spinning this web around me, right? And so as, as, as the devil would keep trying to um, lead us down a wrong path, once a young boy gets a car, then he starts doing what? He starts hanging out with the wrong crowd, doesn't he? So we slowly got into the alcohol, and we had to drink a beer here, and we had to go there and drink a beer, and... And now this was going on, and, and slowly you push God to the back of your mind. You know what I mean? You're still going to church. You still acknowledge God. But I thank God that I never, ever, ever got involved with drugs. I never took any kind of drugs at all, and I'm so thankful that I never went down that path. 
but the alcohol path was, was, was a pretty bad was a pretty bad path and but you know and as as we were growing up uh, we did a lot of things we we did a lot of hunting on the farms we did a lot of fishing in the ponds in the streams things like that we rode motorcycles um, up over the mountains and on the trails and things like that there and but the good thing about working on this farm <coughs> with the um, the bigger farm that I worked on, they had a real nice maintenance shop where they worked on the trucks and the, car, uh, the vehicles and the tractors and the machinery and the corn pickers and you name it. So I got a chance to work in this garage at a very young age and, and I learned to be a mechanic working with some of the older guys there. And I picked up a trade and you know, you learn the difference between a nut and a bolt and a screw and, a, and you l learn a little bit about electricity and batteries and you learn a little bit and uh, what happens is a, a young man like myself, you learn, but you don't know um, how to do things safely and wisely. So I want to jump back to a set of scriptures here. It's found in Romans, the eighth chapter and starting in the 26th verse. So Romans, the eighth chapter, it's a very, very popular verse, but I want to make sure that everybody understands because in the eighth chapter, the 26th verse says, likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also knoweth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So you see what's going on behind the scenes here as I'm learning to be a mechanic and I'm learning to do the farm work and I'm learning to drive and, and all this. The, it, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. He wants us to stay on this divine path that he has us on. He wants us to, to acknowledge him, but sometimes as baby Christians, we just don't have that connection to where we hear the voice of God very clearly. But understand that the Holy Spirit is there making intercession for us. Because the 28th verse of Romans 8, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So you see, I love God. I just didn't have a personal relationship with him. My parents were praying for me, and I thank God that their, that their prayers were answered. But the Bible says that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So, so God has a purpose for each one of our lives. Cause, um, and, I, and I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit loves us and cares about us and watches over us and we see miracle after miracle every single day just to make it through another day on this earth is is just an acknowledgement that god almighty is with us because when i was 16 years old i could say i started working on cars and i and i had this 65 chevelle and i had friends that had cars and some of the things that happened in this next year were some of the faith building things that helped me go on with my Christian walk later in my life because we was working on the transmission, me and one of my friends, and we didn't understand. We put the car up on a ramp, so the car is up on the ramp with the front wheels, and we had to take the transmission out. But we didn't realize that the transmission was what was actually keeping the car because the transmission was in gear, it was in first gear, so the car was like not going to roll backwards. We took the dry shaft off, and we took the dry shaft off, the car rolled back and all but smashed me and the guy that was working on the car. Because when we took the dry shaft off, nothing was holding it up there, and it just rolled right straight back, and we rolled out within a second of being run over. So that's how close you can come to losing your life but now I know when looking back that all things work together for good <clears throat> so it wasn't too much longer after that about another month or two we had another car we was working on that was broke down we had it jacked up in the back 
and we was taking the differential. That's the thing that the back wheels bolt to. We were taking the differential out for some reason, and we had it jacked up real high, and all of a sudden, we, we knocked one of the bolts out, and the whole car fell. And I could remember like it was yesterday that the ground was soft underneath the car because we was working like in a yard, and I had to wiggle my head out from underneath that car just wiggled it, the car was on my head, and I wiggled out from underneath it, and when I finally got out, the car fell onto the ground. And to this day, I thank God Almighty that the angels of heaven held that car up until I could get out from underneath it. Now, why God loves us so much is just mind-blowing, but you never, ever forget when you have a close call like that that all things are working together for good, for those that love God. And remember that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So I lived through those two different events, but I mean, I got a, a lot of uh, things that happened that you can't really explain. So now I, I told you I bought this 250 Suzuki. So now I'm up in the mountain riding, coming home from a friend's house about nine o'clock at night, it's dark. It was like an October night and the road was kind of windy. So it doesn't take long to get up to 55, 60 mile an hour. So I'm coming down this old mountain road, and I missed the, it was like an S corner, and I missed the corner. And the bike went down in the gutter, and I remember when I got down the gutter, I couldn't get it back out of the gutter going 60 mile an hour. And when I turned the wheel to come back onto the main road, it flipped the bike end over end. And it seems like you're never ever going to stop flopping down the road because I remember the motorcycle going up in the air pretty high and going bang and then I would go up in the air and I would go bang and then the bike would go up in the air and it would go bang and the handlebars would hit and the front wheels would hit and thank God that back then in the state of Pennsylvania you had to have a helmet on because there wasn't much left of my helmet because I just kept going down bang Flipping over, bang, flipping over. I thought, well, I wonder if I'm going to live through this here. But all I remember is it, it knocked me out. And I remember when I woke up, probably not more than a minute or two later, because I was only 16 years old. But I remember waking up and I was laying on the yellow line. And there was no traffic on this old back road, thank God, because they probably wouldn't have seen me. They'd have ran over me. But anyway, um, I remember laying there and I remember waking up and it's like, I'm still alive. I remember laying in the middle of the road. I remember looking at the bike. It's laying right alongside me. But here's the miracle of the whole story is the fact that had I hit a tree or a telephone pole or a rock or anything in all that tumbling, it could have probably killed me or it could have probably broke my back, break your neck, break your arms, your legs, whatever. But because somehow the Holy Spirit kept me in the middle of that road, just bouncing down the middle and kept the bike going down the middle of the road. And it just uh, it, it tore my pants up and it tore my shirt up and uh, I was brush burned, but I wasn't seriously hurt. So I was able to stand up, shake the dust off of me. I got the bike up and I got it running and I rode it home. But the interesting thing is. The Holy Spirit had my mother at home praying for me that night. Now, mother always went to bed a little bit after 9 o'clock because she had to get up early in the morning with, with dad to get him off to work. And, and, of course, like I was telling you last week, there, there's seven children in, in our family. So mother had quite a bit of duty to do in the morning, but she always went to bed a little bit after 9 o'clock. Well, it was almost by the time I got home on that bike, it was almost 10 o'clock. And we lived in a two-story farmhouse, and my bedroom was upstairs, so I snuck in the back door and started up the steps. And my mother said, Donnie, come here. Well, I didn't want mother to see these pants all tore up and, and, my, and all these brush burn bruises over my arms and legs and everything. And so I went in to where mother was at there in the living room, and she said, uh, what's going on? And I said, I wrecked a motorcycle, and I'm thinking, how did she know? How did she know I wrecked this motorcycle? 
But for some reason, the Holy Spirit had her up praying that evening. Now that's how our Father in heaven works. He always knows. He has somebody interceding, praying for you. And my mother seen all them brush burns and the pants all tore up. And I'm sure that she was thankful in her heart that at least her baby boy didn't come home in a body bag that night. But God Almighty is always with us. He always knows everything. I try to teach my children, you can't do anything because the Bible says that everything that is done will be made manifest. You have to understand that your Father in heaven sees everything that you say, everything that you do. So I am so thankful for praying mommy and daddy that they prayed for me continuously because I was, you know, they knew I had this Chevelle and they really didn't want me to get the motorcycle, but they seen that I went to work every day and I was a pretty hard worker and, and I saved my money. I didn't waste it. And, and uh, so, the, um, but once again, I give glory to my father in heaven for good parents who cared about me. So, uh, so between them three events there, I mean, I'm, I'm almost like a cat with nine lives, and I just spent three of them. But, but this list goes on and on, story after story of how close you, that I came to not being on this planet all because of bad decisions that I make. But thank God that he had his hand on me, right? But Revelations, to, um, Revelations the 12th chapter, the definite verse said, that we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. These testimonies stayed with me my whole life, and they helped lead me to Christ because you never forget when these miracles happen. You never forget it. And in the back of your mind, you think, I wouldn't be here without Jesus. I wouldn't be here without God Almighty's hand of protection being upon us. So like I say, the stories go on and on and on, and it's just like, I just thank God that the steps of a good man are, are ordered by the Lord. So now I'm 16 years old. I'm almost 17 years old. And this may be hard for you young folks to believe, but the minimum wage in 1974, when I was seven, 16, going with 17, was $2 an hour. So now I'm working at this farm, you know, working, having all this fun, grinding feed and all that stuff. So this campground calls me up and they offer me this job for... Two dollars an hour. Well, that's minimum wage, and I was still in about eleventh grade in high school, and um, so I took this job. I thought I'm done with farming. No more orchards, and no more apples, and no more bugs and flies and poison ivy and all this stuff and snakes. And I thought, man, I'm done. So I go to this campground, and and my my daughters actually go up to this campground a lot and they have the bluegrass festival because they love the christian music that the uh the banjos and the guitars play at the at the bluegrass but um but granite hill campground there oh, about a mile out of fairfield um offered me this job as the maintenance man i thought wow this is cool i get to ride around this campground everybody's in party mode you know everybody's living like it's uh you know their their last days and Everybody's camping and having fun, but I got to mow the grass and work with the wood pile and pick up all the garbage because everybody sets their garbage. And there was probably about 200 campsites there, so I got to pick up all the garbage, meet another guy. But it was a, it was a lot funner job. And, of course, once again, God Almighty had his hand upon my life. So, so I went out here to this campground and was having all kind of fun, but... Um, that's when my life was about to change, wasn't it, Lisa? Because yeah. my beautiful wife of 46 years is here, and, and she knows um, what happens next is, uh, is uh, kind of like God's divine hand um, leading two people together at a very young, very, very young age. Because I, I was 16, and my wife, who was 14 at the time, uh, she, my wife, I was, I was worked as a maintenance man at, the, at this campground, and my wife Lisa was working in the snack bar. You know, her job was, you know, they had like pinball machines and air hockey stuff back then, and 
all these different games, and she worked in a snack bar making hamburgers and french fries and ice cream and soda and whatever anybody at the campground wanted to buy. Uh, she, she worked back there, so, um, so uh, as time went on, uh, like I say, I would slip in and, and see this beautiful, young, blonde-haired, blue-eyed blue uh, beauty queen, and, uh, and like I say, we would talk from time to time, and, but one thing about my wife is that her older brother worked at the miniature golf because their daddy wouldn't let Lisa out of his sight without one of her brothers, and she had three brothers. So her older brother Bobby always worked there with her, and he was at the at the uh, miniature golf. Lisa worked, as they say, as the uh, in in the snack bar. But God Almighty had a plan. Once again, all things work together for good for those that love God. So it wasn't but maybe a couple of weeks later, this young, blonde, blue-eyed little girl starts calling me up every night, and she kept saying, I know somebody that likes you. I know somebody that likes you. So it's like, God Almighty. Now, you see, I had this Chevelle and this motorcycle, and I was just running and running and running and having a, a heyday. But God had other plans, didn't he? God Almighty had a special plan. So it turns out that we talked for a while. And then within a month or two, I got invited to come down to her house to meet her mom and her dad and her three brothers. And... I was allowed, and, and, and this is another thing that I'm so thankful for, because we, we as a family, about a year ago, did a really in-depth study on the biblical Jewish courtship between a young man and a young woman, and this was about as close to the Jewish courtship that you could get, because I was allowed to come down to Lisa's house with her mom and dad and their three brothers, and we watched either Archery Bunker or Dukes of Hazard, or Sanford and Son, or The Walton, some show that was on TV. Now, you got to remember, you only, we only had one or two channels back then in the, in the early 70s like that. You didn't have a lot of TV to chick pick from, but I got to spend an hour with my future bride in the presence of her mommy and her daddy and her brothers, and that's what we called a courtship. And after about a month of going down there, like on, it was either a Wednesday or a Thursday evening, I don't know what happened, but somehow I think I gave Lisa a peck on the cheek goodbye one evening, and that was the wrong thing to do. Because <laughs> her, her daddy met me the next time I come down. When I pulled in, he said, Out, boy, hit the road, and don't ever come back on my property. And that was just for pecking her on the cheek. You know, it's like, ooh, I thought, man, this is, this, this is like the old Jewish biblical days. It's like, you know, you do what daddy says because daddy's in charge. So, uh, so I thought, well, I'm a, I, I blew that. Now, uh, what am I going to do now? But, you know, you always have that little prayer in the back of your head that you say, Lord, you know, I messed up. Help me out here a little bit. So um, as time would have it, Lisa kept begging her daddy to let me come back down on, on Wednesday or Thursday night. So he graciously allowed me to come back, but he, he was one of the old-time daddies that protected his daughter for, no, for, for anything. He was going to protect her. So it turns out that now I'm allowed to start coming down on Sunday afternoon to go on a two-hour car ride. And then we was going to stop and see Granny on the way home. So that was how we dated for almost a year. An hour on Wednesday evening, while everybody else that you went to school with, the boys and girls were dating all night. They was out all night. They was out all weekend. They was at drug parties and alcohol parties. And everybody was fun. Because this is 1974, 1975 time frame. You know, everybody, the, the hippie movement was going on and everybody was just partying. But not Donnie and Lisa. We were sitting in the living room with mom and dad watching. And like I say, this went on for almost a year to the point where then we was, me and Lisa was allowed to go away, provided we took two or three of the brothers along. So she had a bodyguard with her at all times. And I'm so thankful to God Almighty that he protected us at a very young age because he, uh, he, he, um, he knew what he was doing. God Almighty knew what he was doing. 
So this true biblical courtship went on like that for about a year. And now it's, um, 19, it's probably the spring of 1976. And so another campground, they were building another campground on the other side of Gettysburg. So they offered me a 10 cent an hour raise. So now I'm up to $2.10 an hour. And I get to work construction at this other campground. So now I'm helping them you know, do all the electrical work and the sewer work and the plumbing work and the electrical work and, and all building all kind of buildings and driving tractors and I'm helping them build this other campground now. So it's, it's, it's spring of 1976 and I'm getting ready to graduate high school. So I graduate in the June of 1976 and um, working at, at this other campground as a construction and uh, it turns out that the man and woman that was building this were actually born again Christians. So now you see how the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. Now I'm in the presence of true believing Christians that talk about God, that talk about the things of heaven, that tell you how good God is, and how God wants to be with you. So, so um, I was still dating my wife, Lisa, uh, me and my girlfriend, Lisa, at the time. And... As time would have it, I uh, graduated high school, and for some reason, I was thinking that if I'm ever going to get married, I can't get married living, making $2.10 an hour. So I had this thought of going in the Air Force, and so as time would have it, the Air Force recruiter came by, but to show you how God Almighty is in charge, I signed up to go in the Air Force. They sent me over to Harrisburg to do my induction physical, and I failed it. They tried to tell me I was diabetic, but I wasn't diabetic. I ate 10 pancakes that morning for breakfast, and they did a blood test, and my sugar was high because I ate before they did the sugar test. But that delayed my entry into the military by almost two months. Two months went by, and then I had a pretty bad cut on my arm, and the recruiter said, you can't go to basic training with an open cut like that. It's got to be healed up. So that delayed it like another six weeks or so. So rather than go in the military, but you got to remember that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That gave me three more months to be with my beautiful blonde girlfriend, isn't it? So we spent the summer together. And, and you know, God Almighty gave me a, a, a woman whose heart was so kind, so loving, so caring. And you would think that a young girl would say, no, I don't want you to go in the military. No, I don't want you moving away. But her comments were, whatever you think is best, whatever you think is best for us, then go ahead and do it. So I signed up for the Air Force in 1976 and, and, uh, and I left on September 8th of, of uh, 1976, of course, I went to basic training. But here's the thing that I'll never forget. I'll never forget, see, when you join the military, you can get a guaranteed career. And if you want to be a mechanic, they guarantee you're a mechanic. You want to be an electrician, they'll guarantee you. You want to be an um, airplane mechanic, they will guarantee you a job and they'll guarantee you a base to go to. And they do that because they know that, you know, a, a, a happy uh, military person is going to produce, you know, a whole lot better than somebody that's unhappy. But I signed a blank contract with the military and I said, I'll go anywhere in the world and I'll do any job that you need me to do. And it turns out that when I got to basic training, they told me I was going to be a jet mechanic. Now, what, what people don't understand is when you sign for the military, they could have sent me to some what they called gator site. It's actually a radar site in the top of Switzerland or the top of Germany. It could have been, it could have been in the middle of the middle. It could have been in Iran or Iraq at a, at, a, at a radar site. And you're stuck in there for a year at a time. You can't leave. There's no commissary. There's no bay. And there are terrible assignments. But what happened is that God Almighty knew what he wanted for my life and for Lisa's life. So he coordinated that I would be a jet mechanic and that I would go to Chanute Air Force Base, which was in Illinois. Um, I would go there for like 10-week 
class to learn how to work on jets. And then my permanent assignment was at McGuire, which is in New Jersey, which is only about a little bit over three hours from where my girlfriend was at. So the Lord arranged it so that when I got to New Jersey, that he had our lives already planned, right? So, you know, as I was in the military, you know, one of, one of the fun things about being in the military is that you get to write letters back and forth. So Lisa would write me, you know, two or three letters a week, and I would write her two or three letters a week. But, but I have to say that God Almighty, and you got to remember that last week I, I said that I was raised Lutheran and that Lisa was raised Catholic. So we both had a love for God, but we didn't have a personal relationship with God. So God Almighty had his hand upon us, and, and he was guiding us and leading us through all these jobs and little adventures and things like that there. And he had his hand of protection upon us no matter what we did. But we have to understand that nobody has told us that we have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Nobody told us that we had to give our life to God. So here we were, you know, just going through life, just doing what we need to do. But remember, just like Jesus' life was totally planned, our life, the steps of a good man, are ordered by the Lord. We are ordered to do the things that God Almighty wants us to do. So I'm going to kind of like stop it right here to, to the, this week here because the first week we went from about from the time I was born up until about 11 years old. And now we went from the time I was 11 years old and, and now I'm 17 years old and I'm signed up for the military. I'm getting ready to leave. And uh, the testimony gets better and better and better because like I say once once you get into the to the Air Force, um, then your, your life totally changes and. But I want to give God all the glory and praise that he's always with us, that he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. No matter what goes on, he is always with us. So I'm going to end it here right now. But remember, Romans 8, 28 says that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All right. In Jesus name, we're all done. So let's end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that your hand of protection and your guiding hand is always, up, always upon us. Lord, you said that you're a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So, Father, we thank you eternally for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.